now it's time for your viewing pleasure, the online show that will change how you think about online shows. Welcome to the Great I.O. Get Together. On tonight's show, fun and excitement like you won't believe. The thrills, the chills. Now join me in welcoming your hosts and mine, Richard and Tara! Thank you, Pete. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the great IO Get Together number one. Uh, my name is Richard. This is my co host, Tara. Hi, everyone. If you've never joined us before, and I know you haven't, we record gigs live so we can take your questions on the show. Uh, live gigs are really just an excuse for our Discord community where you can chat with your fellow IOs during the show or any time that you want. And you can find out more details about all of this uh, at thegig.online. Every show, and this one is no exception, has two halves. In the first half, we have a little fun. In the second half, we get a little more serious with our guest uh, or guests of the day. At the top of today's gig, wait, wait, don't I owe me, an IO Psychology news panel show definitely not produced by WBEZ and National Public Radio. Uh, joining us today is our guest, Dr. Lillian Eby, professor of psychology at the University of Georgia, who just last month became editor-in-chief of the Journal of Applied Psychology. Welcome to the show, Lillian. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, so Tara will be leading us in our game today, so take it away. Okay, Lillian, so if this was NPR, we'd be playing a game called Not My Job. But this is not NPR, so we're going to play a game called This Is My Job. And specifically, we're going to play some trivia about the Journal of Applied Psychology. So people who are watching on the stream, you can feel free to help the panelists with uh, suggestions. You can try to trick them with wrong answers. That's up to you. Uh, but Lillian, you'll be competing against Richard. I have 10 questions about the Journal of, uh, of Applied Psychology. And I'm going to ask you each for your guesses, and we'll go from there. So first question is an easy one, just to uh, just to get you warmed up. So what year was JAP founded? Um, so I'm going to ask Richard to take the first guess on this one. What, what year do you think JAP was founded? Uh, I, I have a very good guess that it is 1917. Final hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. And just final answer, no phoning yeah, a friend. I would... <laughs> <laughs> Lillian, would you like to wager a guess? What's your guess, Lillian? I would say 1917 as well. Okay. All right. So we got some consensus. Again, this was an easy one. Don't get too overconfident. And you're both correct. The hint was that just a few years ago, we had a centennial issue come out celebrating 100 years of JAP. So anyone who saw that issue would know that it was 1917. All right. Let's get a little harder next time. So which one of these people was not a founder of JAP? <laughs> We've got G. Stanley Hall, John Wallace Baird, L.R. Geisler, or Wilhelm Wundt? Oh. Uh, Lillian, it's your first guess this time. So which one I, of these people is not a founder? I will take option D, Wundt. Option D. All right. Bold choice, Richard. Yeah, I, I mean, I was a little worried until seeing option D. So I will <laughs> I will also go with option D. You're not familiar with L.R. Geisler? Shame on you. Um, all right, well, let's see what the answer is. Yes, you are correct. So uh, these three esteemed bearded gentlemen uh, here were the founders of J.P. G. Stanley Hall um, was actually also the first president of APA. Um, a less fun fact about him is that he was also a noted eugenicist. We don't talk about that part. Hmm. Um, so uh, Baird was a, a student of once also um, and Titchener as well. And he sort of followed in Hall's footsteps in a lot of ways. Um, and Geisler was also a student of Titchener. So really like a tight, small club at the, in those days of early applied psychology. Uh, but here's here's the craziest part. Guess where Geisler worked? Richard, do you want to guess? Uh, somewhere important would be my guess. <laughs> <laughs> Lillian, do you know the answer? I would say go dogs, UGA. That's right. University of Georgia, <laughs> which has one of the oldest uh, psychology programs uh, in the country. So uh, proud alum or proud fa former faculty, I suppose. All right. You guys are doing well. Again, don't get too confident. Uh, all right. Now, open-ended response here. Mm. How many people have been chief editors? Richard. Oh. How many people have been chief editors? Jeez. Um... Man, I guess 
So let, let's let's I gotta work backwards. So average tenure of an editor is what three, four, five years somewhere in that area. I don't know, twenty low twenties, twenty one. How about twenty one? I'm gonna say twenty one. I think it's like being the president. You know, it burns <laughs> you out quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Lillian, what do you think is the right answer? Well, currently the editorial tenure is six years. So if it were Ooh. six years, the entire life of the journal, that'd be 60, but that seems like too many. So I'm going to say 40. 40. Oh gosh. Well, you guys are both way off. Um, this is the entire list of editors and you will see there are oh. only 18. Oh my. Uh, so part of, you know, some of these editors were really holding on to power for a little too long. I think that's what was going on here. Hmm. Um, just uh, some of these names should be really familiar to our audience, right? A lot of these folks are still writing and publishing and, and participating in the intellectual life of our field. Mm. Uh, all right. Well, take a good look at this table for no particular reason. You might need to remember it again. All right. <laughs> let's move on. Oh, boy. What is this graph depicting? So <laughs> we have a graph. We've got the the decade into buckets is on the x-axis. I've oh. concealed the y-axis. Um, the time scale is about 100 years here. We see a, a slight increase, then a dramatic drop around 1947, and then a pretty steep increase every year since. So what is this a graph of? No multiple choices. You just have to guess. <laughs> so... Who wants to take the first guess? Yeah. And do we have any suggestions in the chat, by the way? Are the are the are the guests chatting about what this might be a graph oh, of? No, they they'd have to catch up to us. So they're uh, I don't know. There'll be time to guess. <laughs> oh, too bad. <laughs> yeah. God. So so it's I mean it's JP trivia. I have I have no idea, Richard. Yeah, I mean it's JP trivia, so it's something JP oriented. Uh, we've got. Oh, from 1917, so that makes sense. From 2.5, it looks like a 3 maybe, up to 12. 12. It can't be, it can't be like issues. No, we don't have 12 issues a year. It can't be, man. What are some things that have been increasing steadily for as long as you can remember? Well, certainly the number of submissions, but they have to be scaled very differently. Mm. The number of editorial board members, but it would have to be scaled very differently. Um, right, I think the you... number of issues has increased, but it's not has. We do only have twelve a year, so I'm I'm kind of flummoxed. All right, it sounds like you're 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 both passing on this. The answer yeah. is the mean article length, which. This graph seems suspicious to me, to be hmm. frank, because most JP articles I see are not 12 pages long, but maybe there is some special way of counting. I think if we um, have an issue with this, we can take it up with Steve Kozlowski, who published this uh, particular graph in the centennial issue. We can find out how he calculated that. But right. So this, you know, makes sense that articles have been getting longer and longer um, since the journal was founded, more or less. Um, hmm. So... Is, is, some of the questions coming up, I'm going to show you some of those early articles and you'll you'll see some changes. Is this is this correlated with the use of the word theory? Just... <laughs> Only extant theory, in fact. Oh, OK, of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating extant theory. Yes. All right. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, complete the title of this article from 1965. Effective brand preference upon consumers perceived... Blank. And I've given you a hint because this is tough. So the first letter of the blank is the letter T. T. So what do you think consumers had a brand preference about that affected their perceptions in some way? Hmm. You know, this is uh, this is from the era of uh, of I.O. where I.O. wasn't so I.O. -y. So this we had this is more like central consumer psych, like back in the real applied psych kind of era. So this could be anything. What do you think IOE is? Well, like talk, I mean, talking <laughs> about employees. So we, we don't have as much, uh, you know, like human factors split away and we don't have like the true consumer psych, like whatever this probably is. Because um, like my, my immediate intuition here was that T would be trust, but I don't think it's trust given the era. 
That's a good know. point. The early JAP was not an IO journal. It was just an applied psychology journal, mm-hmm. um, you know, broadly defined. So there is no reason to think this is an IO variable. So, Lily, you have a guess? I think it's going to be, yes, I think it's the effect of brand preference upon consumers' perceived time to make purchase decision. Ooh, okay. I like that guess. It's very specific. Unfortunately, very wrong. Although it's too long, so <laughs> yeah. probably time to decision, maybe. So the actual answer is effective brand preference upon consumers' perceived taste of turkey meat. Um, and the findings of this study are that when turkey meat is described to people as being of a brand name, they say it tastes better, uh, which makes a lot of sense and shouldn't be very surprising, but this was in this was in JAP. Um, more fun facts about this article. You can see that the panel was actually held at Wayne State. So if we have any Wayne State students watching, know that this is part <laughs> of your intellectual history. All right. You guys are not doing great on the quiz. And to be honest, I'm not keeping <laughs> track, but but I have hope for you. I think, you know, you'll 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 rebound. All right. Next question. What is the primary dependent variable in this study? So let me just describe it briefly. We've got on the left four conditions. We've got colors military symbols, geometric forms, and aircraft shapes. Okay, so those are the four conditions. Then on the x-axis of the graph, we have the number of displayed items uh, from 20 to 100. And we see that they all have a positive relationship. The, The aircraft shapes line is the steepest and the most um, and the highest in value and the colors is the most shallow and the lowest in value. And I have concealed the y-axis. So I would like you to guess what the primary dependent variable in this study is. And for a bonus point, guess the sample size to within 25 people. (laughs) All right. Who's got a guess? Hmm. I think it's probably some sort of reaction time. And I would say that the um, sample size is 43. Reaction time. Okay, great. So you're reacting to something um, and you react faster if it's a color and you react slower if it's an aircraft shape. Okay. Correct. Would you like to take a guess? Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Because with more... Yeah, because any sort of accuracy metric wouldn't go up with more displayed things. So it has to be something inverse. So reaction time makes a lot of sense. In, though... God, when those, so I, my guess would be this is like 60s, 70s kind of thing. So it's definitely not going to be sample sizes like we have now. Okay, um, so we're thinking like 20-ish people per condition? Sure. Yeah, let's let's say 50. Yeah. Okay, well, let's take a look. So you're very close on the dependent variable. The um, outcome is counting time and errors. The idea is that people are presented with uh, sheets of symbols and they were instructed to count say all the planes or all the triangles or all the red things and the conclusion is that it's easiest to count the colors and it's hardest to count the aircraft shapes um, so not surprising although we can you know question the rigor of the study in terms of uh, whether the only difference between conditions is, is the named difference between conditions um, the sample was eight eight oh. people uh, <laughs> Now, to be fair, it was a within subjects design, so um, still, still a little bit low for modern standards. It's another good example of how quickly things change over time. I, I don't imagine yeah. this paper would do very well today. All right, doing okay, I guess. Let's see what we got next. All right, in this study of accident proneness from 1950, which of the following factors was not included as a pr- possible predictor of accident proneness? So we have the percent of employees who belong to athletic associations, the percent of female employees, the mean intelligence, and the mean morale of the employees. So three of these variables were included as predictors of accident proneness of factories, and one was not. Which one do you think was not? I'm certain that I know the answer to this, so I'm going to let Richard go first. <laughs> oh, great. All right, Richard, it's up to you. <laughs> um, hmm. Well, so this is, uh, did you give me a year? Did you say when this was published? 1950. 50. So 50 is, uh, 50 is post-war. So yeah, I would guess that the... Uh, percentage of female employees would be of interest, considering kind of the demographic shifts going on. 
uh, as a result of post-war. Intelligence is like a normal variable at that time, so I think I would include intelligence too. Morale I don't know about. Athletic Association. Athletic Association feels like a purposeful inclusion. I'm, I'm like going... I couldn't have made that up. Yeah. So you're, you're basically trying to game the system. I, you're trying I, to yes. guess how I would make a test. Yes. That's not that's not really the approved strategy. But <laughs> I'm still, fine. I'm going morale. I think it's morale. All right. Lillian, do you concur? I do not. I do think it's the percent of female employees because I think that it was a long time before we really started considering mm. gender and research in I.O. But I could be wrong. I wish that were true. So we have here the results. They measured 40 something variables. Um, they looked at um, the percent of employees who are male, also the percent of employees who are salaried male, also the percent of employees who are salaried female. I would love to know why those two variables have very different effects. I'm having a hard time understanding that. So if you look at item number 18 and 19, the percent of employees who are salaried male has a negative correlation of 0.16, and the percent of employees who are salaried female has a negative correlation of 0 0.40. I'm sure there's a good reason. Hmm. Anyway, um, they also measured morale three different ways, uh, but they and they did measure um, membership in um, athletic associations. Unfortunately, they did not measure intelligence. Oh. Hmm. Um, I would have guessed that, too. I almost tricked myself. All right. <laughs> let's move on. Okay. I'm going to show you two um, very entertaining articles from the 1950s. The first one is about reading abilities of business executives. The, um, the research question here is, do businessmen read? And if so, what do they read? So that is the, that is the premise of this study. And then in contrast, we have another great study from the 1950s. Menstruation and industrial efficiency. Do women who are menstruating have more accidents and less efficiency? Such a charming study. Oh boy. Uh, so we've got our, our two lovely studies. Do men read and are men and are women just, you know, incompetent because they have PMS? So my question for you is, who was the editor when these articles <laughs> were published? <laughs> and remember that I told you you needed to remember that table. That's a good one. That's why we <laughs> Pay attention to the auth to the list of editors. Oh. <laughs> God. Uh, only I think I'm going to plead the fifth on this one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, pass. I don't, <laughs> I don't have anything. Oh, on right. <laughs> I think I forgot to write down the answer. Um, but the answer, I think, is Patterson. So Patterson, oh. who had a 10-year term in the 40s and 50s. Um, so again, another really interesting um, way that our field has changed, right? I don't, I don't imagine that these studies would um, uh, go so well these days. All right, not to make fun of the past, just a you know remark on on how quickly things do change. All right, we are down to our last two questions, and our last two questions are about the other famous Lillian, Lillian Gilbreth. So Lillian Gilbreth, as you know, was a very famous uh, efficiency expert, along with her husband Frank, founder of the fields. Uh, so the first question is, at which university did Lillian Gilbreth spend the majority of her career as a professor of engineering? Any guesses? Ooh. Yeah, I got, I got nothing on that. Nothing. <laughs> there, are, <laughs> there are a finite number of universities. You can just pick one. <laughs> Uh, again, this is this is quite some time ago. So think of you know universities that have been around a while. NYU. <laughs> it's a weird guess. <laughs> I picked a university that's been around a while. That's all I got. <laughs> I suppose. All right, going once, going twice. The answer is actually Purdue University. Oh. So Lillian Gilbreth was a professor of of industrial engineering at Purdue University for most of her career. Uh, uh, there was no apparently um, applied psychology option available at that time. All right, last question, last chance to redeem yourself here. Her autobiography, Cheaper by the Dozen, was made into a 1950 feature film and remade in 2003. So this was a, this was a, a, a novel about her 12 children that she had trained to be very efficient in running the household as efficiently as possible 
which made a, apparently a very charming movie. So the question is, who starred in the 2003 remake of Cheaper by the Dozen? Were they playing her or was this just, this was who, who played Billy and Gilbert? Well, isn't that the question, right? So who starred in the movie? Maybe it wasn't portraying Lily and Gilbert. Aha. Hmm. Uh -huh. hmm. Man, so I don't think I saw it. Uh. <laughs> what? This is the only movie about IO psychology besides Office Space. Same and that. maybe you could argue Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. But uh, <laughs> still, you should probably see it. Oh, boy. Is, wait, is, is, it really, is this a movie about IO psychology? <laughs> I mean, kind of. It's about efficiency. Huh. I, I would do better in office space question. Uh. Next next time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um so I I think it was it a comedy? This was a comedy, right? It was a comedy. Yeah. Um and probably a male lead, considering both of the both of the dates. Um who was a big comedian then? Who was a big comedian in 2003? All right, I'll give you a hint. He's also an acclaimed banjo player. I'm sorry, I only watch dark movies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't watch comedy, so I am at a loss. I appreciate that. Uh, only banjo guy I know is Steve Martin? You are correct, Steve uh, Martin. Even right though on. I basically had to tell you the answer. Yeah. So... Uh, we've it... got Steve Martin starring in yeah. Lillian Gilbreth's autobiography. All right, so uh, <laughs> I think you both lost. That was very bad. Right. Uh, I should make the questions <laughs> easier, but I hope we all learned something along the way. Uh, so, so we've got uh, you know our first half of the show is now under our belts, doing well. We're going to take a five minute break, and then we'll come back and we'll have a hard hitting interview with Lillian. Yeah. See you then. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Welcome back. Thanks for uh, rejoining us. Uh, we are here for the, the serious half of the show with Lillian. Uh, Tara, you got some, some questions to ask, I think. That's right. So fun's over. Now it's time to get down to serious business. <laughs> uh, first of all, really appreciate you uh, coming on the show and spending some time with us. Uh, it's been a really strange year. Where have you been spending the last the last few months? What's your pandemic life been like? Well, I've been doing a lot of um, reviewing of manuscripts, that's for sure. But other than that, sitting in my office at home, but uh, we do a lot of camping. So we've been trying to get out in nature and clear our heads a little bit. But a lot of house remodeling, a lot of um, manuscripts coming across my plate and just trying to make the best of it and be thankful for what we have. It's a pretty good attitude and big lots of bread, I suppose. Um. Right. <laughs> So, uh, you know, in preparing for this interview, I got a chance to learn a little bit more about your career. And it's it's really just incredible how much amazing scholarship you've produced, how many students you've mentored, how many ways you've served the field. And I'm just curious, is this how you imagined your career would end up? I mean, is this how you envisioned it to be when you were a young person? No, not at all. I mean, I, you know, I come from a family of academics and I said I would never be an academic and I was going to do something totally practical. Um, so I had no idea that, that this would be where my life would lead me. Um, so it is, it is definitely would not have been predicted if you looked at my, you know, behavior when I was in junior high school and high school, you would never think that I would have kind of got my act together and, and been able to accomplish so much. Huh. What, I mean, what was it about the family of academics that made you say you didn't want to do that? Well, I mean, I think I just, I've always had a real rebel side to me. And, you know, I was always drug around to museums and bookstores. My dad was an English professor. Mm -hmm. My mom was a librarian. You know, so we, we did all these wonderful cultural things that I, I actually thought was really boring at the time. And so I think part of it was just not wanting to be like everyone else um, and trying to kind of carved my path in a different way. Um, and then, you know, here I sit as an academic. So wasn't real successful in that regard, but I had I had a lot of fun along the way. I, I would I like to I would like to hear more rebel stories. What what is Yeah, no, most of that's not for prime time. So <laughs> you'll have you'll have to hit up some of my friends. 
Sounds good. I did read a study a long time ago that the children of academics are are sort of less likely to want to pursue that as a career path. I assume it's because they see people working nights and weekends and they think, oh, that doesn't look very fun. But, you know, I suppose all children want to rebel against their parents in their own way. So right. at what point did it start changing for you? At what point did you say like, huh, maybe I, maybe I should try out this academic professor kind of life? Well, I mean, it was, you know, I went into a master's program first, again, you know, thinking, okay, I'm going to get an advanced degree, but there's no way I'm going to be a professor. So I went into a master's program at UNC Charlotte and had an absolutely wonderful mentor who was so kind to me and really believed in me and got me involved in some research. And that's kind of when the light switch went off, right? And I was like, wow, oh, this is really interesting. And then I did an internship and I thought, oh, this is really boring. And you know, so that was kind of at that point that I decided that I would at least pursue a PhD, still thinking I would be, um, you know, a practitioner, but decided to pursue the PhD. And then, you know, just kind of a, again, through the doctoral training and really loving research and thinking, okay, I'll just go on the academic job market and see what happens. It just, it kind of all came together. So it was nowhere near as planful as I think many people assume these things are. It's a really good message, right? That it's, it's difficult to sort of forecast into the future exactly what your life will look like. So you mentioned your your great mentor at, at UNC. Is that what led you to develop a, a research interest in mentorship? Well, I think it probably was. I don't know that I realized it at the time. I was doing work kind of more in the career space and the job loss space because that was what was really going on in the, you know, in the in the late 80s, early 90s. Not that I really want to date myself, but but I do think that that experience was really formative for me. And then I had some experiences with mentoring in a variety of other contexts that weren't so great. And so I just became really fascinated with, you know, kind of the bright side and the dark side of <clears throat> of relating. And then, of course, my interest in I.O., it just seemed like a really good fit for me. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that there are sort of topics that become trendy and then everyone does those things and then the, the topics fade out of trendiness. I know that's how Richard chooses his uh, topics to research. Whatever's cool at the moment, it's what he does. Oh, I, I thought you were going to say whatever was beginning to fade. Great. So has it been a has it been a totally charmed life as far as your career or were there were there moments where it took a, a wrong turn and you had to backtrack? Yeah, that's a good question. So I mean I've definitely had a I think a a non-traditional career as an IO psychologist. So, you know, the beginning was like tenure track and, you know, cranking out all the research and trying to stay busy. And then I kind of got plugged into a group here on campus at an institute that really fosters interdis interdisciplinary scholarship that ironically now I direct. But at the time I got involved in this group and got really interested in areas of research that were quite far afield from kind of traditional IO or taking IO and applying it in different contexts. So then I had about a 10 year span of having lots of grant support from, from the National Institutes of Health and kind of running my little small business um, with, you know, armies of students and, and full-time workers. And so I kind of got very far removed from IO for a while, but that was actually, it was good and bad. It was really challenging and different, but then I kind of felt a little more like I'd lost some of my roots and identity. And so then after that, after that ended, then I kind of came back into kind of back into the IO space again. So I, I, I've had, I don't know if they've been, you know, bumps. Of course, I've had lots of bumps. I've had tons of articles rejected. I've, you know, had had relationships with students that have been fantastic and others that have been more challenging for me and the students. So, you know, there's always bumps along the way. But I think what's so great about our, about our profession is you can, you know, you can always pick yourself up, you can always dust yourself off, and you can always make yourself into something different. And that's what I've really loved and enjoyed about the work I do. And now I work with faculty all across campus. I do a lot of mentoring. I'm involved in a, a huge pro, a huge grant, um, multi-institutional grant, developing mentoring programs for faculty. And, you know, it, it's not hardcore IO, but it's a really a way for me to leverage my skills, which has been really great. Yeah. And, and who gets to say what's hardcore IO anyway, right? It's, it's IO if you say it is, I think. Um, and so, so um, with the caveat that survivorship bias is real and, and asking successful yeah. people how they became successful is sometimes a trap, you know, what are the pieces of advice that you might give to someone starting out um, if they sort of aspired to have a career like yours? 
Yeah, well, I don't know that I don't know how many people would really want to have a career like mine, but let's just assume for a minute that they want to. Um, you know, you got to be passionate. And so I was giving a talk this morning for a, a university in China and and I got asked the same question. I said, well, I think it's just like I really, really love the field and I really f love what we do and the content and it. I'm just really passionate. And so I would say, you know, not everyone has to have this kind of career, of course. And so you need to follow your passion and whether it's as a consultant or as a teacher or as an academic or as a leader in the field, that that's where the action is, right? Where it really, where it really meets your heart. So that's what I would say. Um, you know, you gotta be resilient. You've got to draw on your friends. You've got to find good collaborators. Um, you got to recognize bad ones. And, um, and I mean, I think that's, that's just, that, that's kind of in a nutshell of the advice I would give. I think that's terrific. I'm assuming you don't want to name any names, so I won't ask you to do that. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> name the good names, right? So Tammy <laughs> Allen, who's my, my research wife and my best friend, you know, she and I are, you know, we're just, we, we, we're so close interpersonally, but she's also a great reality check for me. And, you know, our writing styles are complimentary and we can tell each other what the heck were you thinking on this? And so finding those people, whether they turn out to be your best friends or not, is kind of irrelevant, but finding those people is is really great. And I won't tell you anything. There haven't been that many bad ones, but there have been a few. All right. We won't push you on that. Uh, I really appreciated you saying that, you know, you have to do this because you want to, because you're passionate about it. Because I think uh, a lot of people feel this pressure to chase external metrics uh, because that's how you get noticed and that's how you get a job. But uh, it sounds like you're saying that that's ultimately not the way to have a career you're proud of. Happy to hear yeah. you say that. Yeah, no, I, I, that's what I think. And, you know, I think the thing I've learned, too, in working with doctoral students is, you know, when they see someone who's, you know, who has, you know, has had a lot of successes, it can be really intimidating. And so I try to help them understand that I know you probably don't want my life. Sometimes I don't want my life. And that's okay. <coughs> you just got to figure out the path you want to take. And, you know, there's a lot of ways to make a contribution and we need outstanding teachers. We need outstanding practitioners. We need outstanding scientists and we need people who can do all of those things. And so there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, there shouldn't be value in terms of which path people choose. It's, it's all about finding your passion and, and that's what will make you successful regardless of what the choice is. That's great. Well, speaking of doing things that you're passionate about, uh, I'd like to shift gears and talk a little bit about your uh, term as editor of JAP. But before I do that, Richard, are there any questions that are coming on the chat that you wanted to raise? And we're on a bit of a delay. Okay, we, well, um, I'm sure we yeah, can pull we, them back up at the end if, if necessary. Delay. But I don't, I don't um, right so let's now. just jump right in then. So, Lillian, you're the yeah. first woman to serve as editor of JP. What does that mean to you? Um, well, you know, this is again, you know, people think I'm so planful and I have like this whole, you know, this this, this whole career figured out. Um, this was something that I was hesitant to put my hat in the ring for. I wasn't sure that I wanted to do it. I really liked doing the behind the scenes thing and developing authors as associate editor and eventually was convinced to at least go through the first round. And then when I got through the first round, I was, you know, like, okay, I have to really make a decision here and thought long and hard about it and decided that I really wanted to do it, but didn't really have didn't really have a, that much time to even really think about why I wanted to do it. Um, and so I guess what I'm saying is now that it's in the rear view mirror, um, it means so much to me. And the reason it means so much to me is I realize how important it's been to other people um, to show other people that, you know, it doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter if you've had kind of a, a less traditional career. It doesn't matter if you're not like super plugged in in a political way. And I'm not saying other editors have been, but I think sometimes that's the that's the the belief or the view. None of that stuff matters. Um, you can make these decisions and you can do these things and you can be successful. So it's meant a lot to me to, to you know, I don't want to say I'm a role model for people because that makes me feel like I'm putting myself on a pedestal. But a lot of people have reached out to me and been so happy that I've been able to, you know, move into this role and that it's meant a lot for them to see a different kind of face at JP. And that has meant so much to me. Well, I certainly agree with that sentiment. 
Uh, I'm, I'm imagining it's an enormous change to your life, though, that there are a lot of things you had to kind of put aside or put on the back burner to, to take this on. Um, so I think we're, we're all grateful that you decided to do it. Uh, what are some of the things that you hope to accomplish during your term? Some goals, some hopes, some dreams? Yeah. So, I mean, we've already done a ton and I don't want to, I don't want to spend the time talking about all the things we've accomplished, but, um, you know, I really, I really was wanting to do what I can to get our work out there for the public good. That was a big part of my, um, kind of my mission statement that I submitted and, and really something I felt really strongly about. I've done a lot of kind of more translational work for a long time. And so, you know, I really want to do what we can to try to get our work out there quicker, get it in the right hands. And so we had the COVID call with Rapid Review, which has generated a lot of great articles, still have a ton in the pipeline. You know, we've got a partnership where we're trying to get um, some of these, make translational summaries that are not really popular press, but they're they're evidence-based, but they're written for like a, an executive level audience, trying to get trying to do those on a monthly basis, make them available free of charge online, getting them in the hands of executives, but also feeding them back to the authors so they can get publicity for their work within their university, which is really important for universities, but we don't, we don't know how to write these things because we're scholars, we're not journalists. Um, so, you know, the translational work we've been doing and, um, you know, the, the COVID call has been a, a big accomplishment. We've got a special issue on racism that's coming out. We just finished the call for papers. I'm really super excited about that. I'm really, as the first woman editor, it's really important to kind of walk the walk. And so we've greatly diversified our editorial board in all possible ways. Um, not just the obvious ones, but international folks, um, making sure we have a good representation of psychology and business. And we're really pushing a lot of open science initiatives, which you'll hear more about as um, APA continues to push that out. Um, and I think my team is just amazing. Like everyone's so committed. We've really all bought into the idea of developmental reviewing and providing feedback to reviewers and authors, even if it's, if, even if it's a rejection that will really help them improve their work. So, I mean, these are some of the kind of short term things we've done in the last year. Um, cause we started taking manuscripts January 1, 2020 that, um, I'm getting a lot of really good feedback about, uh, which has been really fulfilling. That's great. Let me ask you more about that COVID call. So um, for people who are watching who don't know, the idea is to dramatically speed up the review process so that the um, research can get out there in a much more timely manner. And um, I'm wondering what you think about this. I mean, it, if it's possible to do it for COVID, um, is it possible to just do that, to just make our research more timely and get it out there more quickly for people so that they can take advantage of it? Yeah, I don't. Um, and I'll tell you why. I think, um, I'm, and not for a journal like the Journal of Applied, um, it's an enormous strain on the system, and it's an enormous strain on reviewers, and it's an enormous strain on associate editors. Um, and I'm telling you, the commitment that my team put to this is just really amazing. I mean, we had over almost 700 submissions from April 10 to December 31st, on top of our normal submissions. Wow. Um, and I think it also puts a huge strain on just the publication machine at a place like APA. So I don't think, unfortunately, I don't think it's feasible, but it doesn't mean we can't do it occasionally. And it doesn't mean that we can't think about this long term and really push our publishers to think about ways to make this publication process go more quickly. Um, but it, it, you know, if I had known what I was getting into when I did this, I probably would have still done it, um, but I would have thought a lot more long and hard about it, I can assure you. Mm -hmm. Have there been any conversations about open access with your team? Um, it's not a decision we make, Tara. So as an APA journal, we have no control over that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't, we do make some articles open access. So we have a few open access articles on our website. We have made some of the COVID articles, but I, I say we, I mean APA. So I can actually can't, I can make decisions about how to run the journal operations, but I can't make any strategic decisions mm -hmm. about JP without first running it by APA. Like I can have my initiatives and whatnot, but uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty big bureaucracy. So I don't see <laughs> APA moving toward open access because they're a publishing house and you know, 
They get a lot of their revenue for APA through their journals program. Um, but I think they are open to making select articles open with rationale, right? So if we have something like the COVID call and we, we really want to make sure that those are, are more accessible, I, I think there's some willingness, but I think there's a long way to go to get them to really understand how that adds value for APA. Right. Well, they always say large bureaucracies are like uh, cruise ships, right? That they take a long time to turn. <laughs> so once you once you get them going in a direction, that's that's sort of the direction they're going for a while. But but on the on the flip side, I'd just say you know APA is very committed to diversity and inclusion. They're they're very committed to open science, and they're pushing some pretty major changes, which I, I can't really talk about yet. So I, I and they're actually pretty hands off. So while they're bureaucratic, like they've let me do what I wanted to do. I just have to, I just can't make, I couldn't make a decision like an open access decision. But in terms of, you know, the call for papers, they were incredibly supportive. You know, they gave me the support I needed at APA to make that happen because of course it affects the publication process. So, you know, it, it's kind of like having a boss who's not really watching. And as long as you do a good job, you, you're kind of, you're allowed to do what you want. So, so that's all good, but it, it does come with some, it does come with some barriers and I have to be careful not to talk about, for example, policy at JAP. I can talk about practice, but policy has to go through a, you know, kind of another layer of approval. Hmm. Super interesting. So I, I, so I have a question related to that. So all these changes that you're putting in, uh, especially related to uh, like DEI kind of issues, there's, there's often a problem where that kind of initiative needs a champion and after that champion is no longer involved sometimes things kind of fall apart and i'm so i'm wondering right. are you yeah are you setting in place i mean are you pushing for policy or or what what are you doing to um to, to you know to make sure these changes really stick yeah that's a great question richard so i mean i guess the first thing i'll say is i'm in it i'm in it for six years mm -hmm. so like it or not i'm gonna be here for a while so you know, I feel like I have th that's that's better than being in a position for a year or two years where then you're in and you're out. So I feel like if I can kind of it's right, I've been really trying to push the needle in the first year before we even technically were, you know, even even before we were technically the incoming team, we were making changes. Hmm. So I'm really hopeful that we can in, a, in in three years, four years, make changes that will be the shift toward a culture change. So that'd be my hmm. first thing. The second thing I'd say is I, you know, I would hope that people would like the direction that JP is going and the next editor would want to continue some of these initiatives. Now I realize that is a hope, but I, I guess I feel, I feel pretty confident that many of the things we've done have been very appealing across the board. And so as long as someone has enough energy to continue to do these things, who comes in after me, I'm willing to support and help them make that happen. Um, there will be things like the, the open science um, stuff that's coming down the pike that will be policy change, right? Mm -hmm. So APA basically said we have to do better, we have to do more, and each journal can decide the extent to which they want to adopt certain kinds of practices. So as a team, we made decisions about that, and that will be policy. So I don't want to make it sound like, you know, we can't make policy change, but some of the, some of the littler things... Um, like we have some conflict of interest policies or excuse me, practices that we have in place that the journal didn't have that I thought were really important for the optics of reviewing. And so we put those in place, but it's not a policy, it's a practice. But I assume those things would continue because they're they're not likely to harm anyone. Well, along those same lines, you know, um, and to sort of wrap up our conversation, when you when you look ahead to six years from now and you're you're passing the torch to the next editor, what do you hope your legacy will be? I mean, you've mentioned several um, practices that you're hoping will will stick. I mean, from, as far as a big picture, what do you yeah. want people to say about your term? Well, I will not be passing. I'll be throwing that torch and running <laughs> in the other direction. So let's just be. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know. It, it is daunting to think of five more years, but um, you know, I, I really hope the field, I mean, I hope that we've had an influence on other journals. So, you know, journals do look to each other. And so I hope that we've had an influence to other journals in terms of really, really thinking about ways, and, and we have not figured this out, but thinking about ways to um, enhance inclusion 
in all aspects of journal operations from editorial boards to editors to the reviewing process to helping reviewers understand how they might inadvertently um, insert bias into their reviews and and not not because it's the right thing to do even though it's the right thing to do because it makes our science better and so i hope that i hope that we will leave a legacy in that regard i also hope that me serving will inspire other people who are maybe were not considering doing it because they didn't think they fit to consider putting their hat in the ring and doing this that that would be fantastic and I really think that a lot of our efforts around recognizing reviewers and helping reviewers be better at their jobs and helping authors do better science through a whole host of things that have either happened or coming down the pike, um, I hope that that will be the legacy. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with us. It's been really terrific to learn more about your plans for the journal and a little bit more about you. Really appreciate it. And thanks for coming on the show. Sure. Thanks so much for having me. It's been super fun. Um, as always, please join our Discord so you can chat with us before, during, and after the show. Uh, definitely hit that subscribe button in YouTube so you never miss us going live. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Oh, the times were hard and the wages low. Leave a Johnny, leave a, leave a Johnny, leave a. Oh, leave a Johnny, leave a. For the voyage is done and the winds don't blow, and it's time for us to leave her. I can't believe it's already over. Can you? To keep the excitement going, check out our website at thegig.online. Join our Discord community to chat with your hosts and your fellow giggers. Subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you never miss a gig. Above all, thank you for joining us, and see you next time for another great I.O. get-together.